2006. My name is Rosalind Benjet. Um, we're here for the oral history of Louise Gardner um, for the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. Mrs. Gardner, tell me about your family. Where did they come from and how did they get to Dallas? Well, my mother came from St. Louis, at least that's where my father met her, and he was originally from Russia. And I don't know how they met exactly, but it was a quick romance, I understand. And they got married. It's not like today, you know. <laughs> and uh, they moved to uh, Texas. And I don't know too much about them or uh, their families. I mean, I'm, I wish that I did know, but I just never, we just never thought about it. Mm -hmm. And do you have any idea when they came to Dallas? No, I really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, except that I have a sister. They just died recently, and she was 97. Mm -hmm. So they had to come prior At least to that. Prior, so she was born here. She was born in, I think, Cushing, Texas. Mm -hmm. But in Texas. Right. And what were your parents doing, do you know, in Cushing, Texas? Well, um, my father was... I think uh, he sold um, dry goods. I mean, that was a sort of a thing that you did in those days. And right. then he went in, into, I think, men's suits. And uh, he just sort of changed his profession around. But that's how he really got started. Mm -hmm. And um, when he came to Dallas, uh, I know he had a used car lot. And he invested in some properties. And his... Uh, uh, interests were quite varied also. Mm -hmm. So he was he was no longer in the dry goods business when no, you were no, a child? No, mm -hmm. Where did you live when you were a child? I'm a Dallasite. I've always lived here and I lived in Oak Cliff. Mm -hmm. I still remember the number 816 North Windermere. What? And I went to school um, in Oak Cliff, of course and uh, moved to South Dallas when I was in my junior year, I believe, of high school because my mother felt that I should be among Jewish kids because there was only one other Jewish family living in Oak Cliff. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was South Dallas like when you moved there? Well, of course, it was all Jewish. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother... Um, my father didn't want to move, so she didn't even ask him. And she was really a pioneer, and I didn't appreciate it at the time, but she went out and rented an apartment and told him. <laughs> it was quite a shake-up. Mm -hmm. And um, did your family belong to a synagogue? Yes, my father belonged to, I think, a good Sakam. It was uh, very religious, and my mother didn't like that because you couldn't sit with the, you know, they had to sit separately. So she joined Temple Emmanuel, which wasn't too far away. And my father in the beginning was so religious that he would walk to the synagogue from Oak Cliff on the high holy days. And how did your family celebrate Jewish holidays? Um, I guess in the, you know, I didn't appreciate what was going on. I mean, we celebrated, but not to a great extent. We were, we lived in Oak Cliff, mm -hmm. and my Gentiles never felt any, you know, any similar, or what, any, you know, no I didn't feel different from anyone else, except we never had a Christmas tree, which didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. And um, did you attend Hebrew school or Sunday school when you were a child? Yes, um, Temple Emmanuel. And what kinds of organizations did you participate in as a teenager? You know, I don't remember mm -hmm. because I was not real active in anything that I can, um, you know, really relate to. You were going to high school in South Dallas? I did my last two years, I believe, and I graduated from Forest Avenue High School. Mm -hmm. And what did you do after high school? I went to college. Um, where was that? Um, I went my first year to SMU because I couldn't decide where to go. And then I, I, three years I went to the University of Illinois and got my degree there. Mm -hmm. 
And after college, what did you study? Um, well, home ec. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't have any special design courses or what, right. but I was in the home ec and um, I did take designing. Um, so you were always interested in design? Well, I was either going to be a dress designer, I was going to be an interior decorator, I was going to do something uh, in those areas. And uh, then when uh, my sisters went, you know, into, they started Page Boys shortly before I graduated. Well, anyway, then I went into, um, um, I had a design course and I won a scholarship to a um, design school in New York, the Traffic and School of Design. This was on graduation. Um, I received this mm -hmm. and um, I was so excited about it because it was quite prestigious. Yes. And no one encouraged me to go. My sisters kept saying, we need you and we need you now. And so that's what I did. So you didn't go? No, so I didn't go. And of course, I always wonder what I missed by not going. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I went to the real world mm -hmm. immediately and uh, Page Boy and um, with my sisters, we you know, acclaim, we had national acclaim and uh, it was, it were, we worked beautifully together because we worked in different areas. Well, let's go back to when your sisters started the business. How, well, they started them? shortly before I graduated mm -hmm. from college. I was in college when they started. But you probably want to know, what, how did they kind of, what how did we come up them? with the name Page Boy? Right. That's what everyone always wants to ask because it's a strange name. Well, in olden times, a page boy used to go out and announce the heir to the throne. And the page boy wore a little tight little, you know, mm -hmm. um, hat, you know, and uh, a loose jacket. And that's how page boy started, was with a tight fitted skirt with a hole, because that's where the, you know, the Nordstrom came out. And so they had a very slim look, and then the boxy jacket, so it was, it sort of emulated what a page boy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, would, would have worn. Right. And then, so, you know, the horn and announcing the heir to the throne. And so it, so page boy, it just stuck, the name stuck, mm -hmm. and that is the meaning. But what made you decide to have uh, a business that focused on maternity clothing rather than normal clothing? Well, my sister started out with just with a little shop mm -hmm. in the Metal Arts building on the first floor. And uh, this was when I was in high school. And after um, my classes every day, I used to go down and help her. And she always wanted me to go to the wholesale houses and pick out the styles with her. And those were the days when we had quite a market here, you know, a center. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was always, so that was sort of my introduction, I guess, and um, uh, because she depended on me and, and my reward. I remember she used to buy me an ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And so she had this shop there, and then uh, for regular clothes, and um, this was where all the doctors were and the nurses, and so she had a clientele of nurses already built in that would be coming there. They need clothes as well as their uniforms. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how many years she had, then she had the shop. And then my two sisters, they sort of got together and decided, well, why don't they try maternity wear? Because all the pregnant gals would come right past that little shop. Mm -hmm. It was right by the revolving doors. And I can still see it, it was a very small shop. So that's how it actually started. And I don't know, it wasn't too long before I graduated from college and um, was going to do the scholarship. I was so excited, but I was so naive. I mean, those days, you know, every, the kids today, when they graduate, they are so worldly. Well, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And to go to New York by myself and, you know, live there, it was a little frightening. It was a big step. So. Anyway, that was the um, that was the beginning, and uh, we worked together. We never had any major disagreement. Mm -hmm. 
So you started with a retail shop. Yes. And uh -huh. then what you, you expanded and you branched out. Can you tell us about well, that? Uh, yes, I mean manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And it started in the little shop to sell. You have to know what you, you know, what they made was going to sell. Well, mm -hmm. they see they would capture all, all the pregnant women mm -hmm. when they came through those revolving doors to go to their doctor. All the doctors were in the mental arts building at that time. You, you all are too young to know that. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, then they had a dressmaker that made you know some of the things. Then when I joined them, uh, opened a, a factory on uh, Elm Street, a couple of blocks uh, from the Palace Theater, and uh, we were on the third floor, mm -hmm. and. You pass the pool hall on the second floor, but that was our first, you know, where we really had, you know, a factory. Right. And we were there a few years and half through that, and then we moved over on Main Street, uh, just a few blocks, you know, just the next uh, block over, but, you know, a few blocks away. And we had a, a then we had a factory on the second floor. And it was larger. Mm -hmm. And then from there, uh, we built the um, uh, building at Cedar Springs and Olive. Uh, it was a factory. The factory was there plus a re retail shop in front. And if it was still there today, it would be Caddy Corner to the Crescent Hotel. Nice real estate. Well, yeah, well, it was sold, I mean. Now, how did, how did you and your sisters divide up what you did? Okay, well, I was a designer, and um, <coughs> my older sister was one, she, was, she merchandised. She took care of the shops, and um, uh, we worked together beautifully, and then my other sister ran the business end of it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it all worked out. And when we would, oh, I mean, I did things besides designing. When we had opened new shops, I went out. I was one that opened the shop. I was one that interviewed for manager. I mean, you know, I did other things. Right. We weren't just set with blinders on and doing just, but um, anyway, it was a very, and then I got married and. How did you meet your husband? It was a blind day and um, he was working in sales, which was just down the street from where I was on the third floor. <laughs> and that was, uh, you know, and I went with him a couple of years before we got married. Mm -hmm. And he was also a Dallasite? No, he's from Topeka, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And where did, when you opened the businesses, the retail shops, they weren't all in Dallas, were they? No. Where were they? Well, the first uh, one was in uh, uh, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. Beverly Hills. No, wait a minute, uh, it was in Los Angeles across from the uh, Bullets Wilshire. On Wilshire Boulevard, it was a separate building. Uh, it was very unique. And uh, there was a workshop in the back, and that's where my older sister and I, we ended up, we were there, she was running the shop and um, I was designing in the back. Movie stars came in. I mean, it was, it was exciting. So for a while it's, you lived in, in California? Yeah, until the war broke out. Mm -hmm. And then when the war broke out, uh, LA was gonna be bombed. You know, we thought it was gonna be bombed and all. And we were just getting ready to open another shop in San Francisco, but that had to wait until after, after the war. That was World War II or? Yeah, <laughs> World War I. No, no, I mean, was it Korea or no? No, it was World, World War, War II. II. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, um, how did the business continue um, after you were married? Well, I worked full time. I do mean full time. Mm -hmm. And had my children took a minimum time off. I even went to the hospital with the second one from the factory. Mm -hmm. 
And um, so, I mean, it was not one of these, you know, go in me, you know. And there were a lot of decisions to be made mm -hmm. and they depended on me, so I was there. Mm -hmm. And what happened after the war? Well, we continued, of course, and I got married. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, that was, I know I took a minimum time off because I was needed and, you know, I right. was it mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, that part of the business. And we made everything we sold in our shops except the lingerie, so we didn't depend on any other uh, resources. So it was a constant, um, there was really no lack <coughs> because they always needed certain things and uh, we had to supply them. How many stores were you operating at that point? Well, you know, I was trying to remember. Mm -hmm. I think there were four or five, something like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, like five. I, you know, it's been a long time. Sure. <laughs> Did you also provide merchandise to other Oh, yes. we. Businesses? Oh, yes. Oh, that's the other thing I did. Mm -hmm. sale. I was in sales, too. I remember going to New York with my bags with the... Uh, suitcases with the, the samples in and calling on the buyers and making stops on the way to New York. And um, so, I mean, you know, it was the whole um, thing in some of the, um, well, I'll wait for you to ask some more questions, but I was going to tell you some outstanding no, go things ahead. that happened. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of things going on, I mean, you know, at the factory and we had features in all the top magazines of the day. There was uh, uh, Vogue and Harper's and Collier's, Good Housekeeping, Women's, Women's Home Companion. Uh, we were also, when I had my first baby, I know I was in Time Magazine. It was recorded that I, and you name all the top magazines, Women's Home Companion, in fact, one of the pictures you saw on the wall is when I was yes. pregnant. Yes, we saw the picture. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, with my second child when a designer has a baby, and that was in good housekeeping. Mm -hmm. And then the other picture, I was told, oh, this is, I started this yoga break at the factory in the afternoon. You saw the, that mm -hmm. we were on the cover of that Sunday magazine in the Dallas Times Herald, and that was me on setting on my head. Okay, well, let's get, to, let's get to that in a minute. Okay, that's why but I didn't know where to jump As ahead. women, you and your sister were pioneers in starting Oh, absolutely, entrepreneurs. You absolutely were. And for women to be in business in the 1940s and to have a factory? Yeah. What was it like that? when you, oh, we when you went in to talk to all the men? We didn't know any different. You know. Did they, did they treat you well or? Oh, yeah. Didn't feel anything. Did you have any kind of mentors? Anybody that, any other women that you could talk to, or men that you talked to about business issues, or mm -mm. no? We were sort of controlled. No one, just you and your sisters. Well, yes, really that. I mm -hmm. mean, we were covered. You were. Now, let's go back to the yoga now. You became interested in yoga, and we saw the picture of you having the yoga in the Page Boy right. offices. Yes, uh, in the afternoon. Well, uh, my sister and I, my older sister, we took vacations together, and we were in um, um, Rancho La Puerta, that's in, uh, um, it's out of San Diego, mm -hmm. and just over the Mexican border. and. Indra Davy, a yoga teacher, had just moved to Mexico into this fabulous home and she was going to start teaching yoga and I'd heard about it. So I told my Ed and I said, Indra, we've got to go, we got to go meet Indra Davy. So we did and she wasn't certified yet to teach, but she took us. So that was the introduction. And then we told her about the factory and uh, she said, oh, she would always wanted to do something like that for a break in the afternoon to see it would increase their product, uh, productivity, I mean it would relax them. 
So she made us a tape. She came to Dallas and um, made us a tape, and then we did the relaxation every afternoon. We did this for maybe a couple of years. You know how you do these things, and mm -hmm. then you drop them. But it's very good publicity, and it, was, it really worked well. How many people did you have working in the factory then? Oh. I don't know, maybe 30. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not real sure. And a large number of them would participate? Oh, everybody, everybody. did. Everybody. Yeah, the cutting tables, <laughs> uh, they would lie down on those, or else we had these mats mm -hmm. that we gave them. And, but they were if they were at their machine, what they did was this, that with their elbows on the machine, and this, and then they would relax that way. But the others, we had mats for them, and they would lay down on the floors, uh, on the mat, and uh, relax. And um, then I, we continued that for, I don't know, several years, I don't remember mm -hmm. when we stopped or, or what, but that was, and no one really knew what yoga was, and now you've got a yoga studio in every corner, I right. think. But did you re retain an interest in, in yoga yes. after that? Well, I was the one, I was really the one really <coughs> interested. Mm -hmm. And my older sister, she sort of followed me, but the other sister was never really into it. Mm -hmm. So you continued then on your own? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And I wish I had stayed with it more, but you know, you have no support group. There was no support group. Right. Um, Were you involved in both of these the, these activities, yoga and um, page boy, until you retired? Well, yeah, I was interested in yoga, but mm -hmm. not, we didn't do it at the factory. Mm -hmm. I mean, we only did it for a few years. You know, I can't remember when mm -hmm. when we stopped or why we stopped. Mm -hmm. That certainly evades me. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened to page boy? Um, to, well, let me tell you the other, another significant, mm -hmm. really exciting thing that happened when I was, we had a style show, a maternity style show in New York at the Start Club. Mm -hmm. And this was the first style, uh, maternity style show ever. And when we went to Mr. Billingsley, I remember he was the owner, and the Start Club was one of the outstanding, uh, you know, restaurants in New York City, and he thought we were absolutely off our rocker to think that he would allow some, something like that in his restaurant. And but by the time we finished with him and finished talking, he agreed to let us do it, and he put the runways up. We put the runways in, and we had, and buyers came that had never been available to us before, because I remember calling them there never in or never could talk, but when they came to the show, we made lots of new contacts, and it was a really a groundbreaking um, event for Page Boy. Mm -hmm. And how long did you continue in the business? Well, I was there 27 years, mm -hmm. and then I retired my um, other sister, not the older one, she was married, but the other one got married and he came into the business and then he brought his son in. I mean, it was a different operation. Mm -hmm. And um, so I retired and uh, by that time my husband had invested in some real estate and so I, I said it took him quite a while to get around to that, but it worked well and that's how I'm able to do all the things that I can do and I'm just so um, pleased and so grateful that I have the means that I can do my good works. And, and we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, how long did the business continue after that? I knew you were going to ask me mm -hmm. that and do you know what? I really lost touch mm -hmm. because her husband took over, his son took over and it was a different operation and mm -hmm. not so successful, I might say. Mm -hmm. And then they eventually sold out. Right. 
So it's no longer in existence. Oh no, Page Boyd. No, okay. it's at the. No, mm -hmm. the mother works above the mouth. And what do you think of the current maternity clothes? Well, I think they're pretty gross. I mean, <laughs> to show your navel and to um, accentuate. In my day, you used to camouflage it, mm -hmm. and but today they just um, want to bring attention. Mm -hmm. But even though you retired, you started new interests. Tell us about well, yes. the new interests that you started once you retired. But while I was working, the <coughs> one um, charity that I gave to was UJA. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had a business woman's, there was a business woman's group that I belonged to. So that was the only uh, philanthropic um, you know, it, that I um, participated in when I was working because I really didn't have time for any of the other, mm -hmm. other things. And uh, then when I stopped working, oh, you'll like this one. Everyone told me I'd be so bored because, you know, I've been so. So uh, what I did, I signed up for um, sculpture, uh, for um, painting, uh, watercolors, I remember I did, and um, for um, flower arrangement, the Ikebana mm -hmm. flower arranging, and cake decorating. I mean, I just thought, I don't want to be bored. Well, I found out I didn't have to do those things, and I didn't really relate to anything. And then uh, I read in the paper about this line dance class in Garland. And I always loved to dance. So I went there with the idea of bringing this line dance to North Dallas. Mm -hmm. And this was, well, the, I've got dates sort of on that, and that's, you know, what. But that I really related to. And I used to go to Garland twice a week to um, take, you know, a class. A class in, in line dance. Classes. So, and I told the teacher, I said, I want to bring this back to North Dallas, which I did. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I love that. And I did this for nine years. Um, and we would call the Always on Sunday Line Dancers because we always danced on Sunday. We either did a performance uh, someplace or else we had a class. Mm -hmm. We used to go to nursing homes, retirement homes, um, you know, at that sort of thing. And I put together programs <coughs> and it was a lot of preparation to do for this. I even made their first boleros that we did so it all look alike. Well, you'll see, I've got pictures. I've got you know, all this. This is all documented. Were these men and women or? or well, one man. Women? One man, and uh -huh. there were about 12 of us. Mm -hmm. That was, we ran between 10 and 12. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, that was a real fun adventure. And But then after nine years, I got, that was when I started the produce, I don't know, I got interested in other things. And this was quite consuming to put these programs together. And then my people were getting older, mm -hmm. as well as me. And uh, so eventually, and I left someone in charge. She was going to carry on, but it didn't, it didn't work. You've got to have, you know, that really... You need someone who's invested in the project. Well, and she was enthused about it, but you've got to, I don't know, certain passion you've mm -hmm. got to have to put in to, to, uh, to teach and to prepare these programs. Right. So you got into the produce business. Tell right. us about that. And, um, okay, well now, my first uh, really um, significant philanthropy was in Israel. Mm -hmm. After my husband passed away, I wanted to do something special in his memory. And when was that? He passed away in 81, mm -hmm. a long time ago. Anyway, it was two years later. Anyway, I heard about Weitzman. I was on a UJ trip 
to Israel and someone I met on the trip told me about Weitzman and she was so enthused and it was, um, you know, that's in Israel, it's between, you know, are, are you familiar with the Weitzman Institute of Science? Yes. Well, when I saw it, I was completely just blown away by it. I thought it was so fabulous. And so I established a chair there in bio, biochemistry in honor of my husband. And um, that was my first, I mean, that was a big, a big commitment. And um, so that was my, and then I read about this uh, other um, center in Jerusalem, the uh, Hadassah University Hospital there, which is the largest mm -hmm. hospital in Israel. And there was a center there doing research in natural medicine. And that was my thing. And they never contacted me. I called. I knew it was going to be in Israel. And I wanted to know more about this center. And I met Dr. Salin, who was the head of it. And I sent her a nice grant. Because this is what I was interested in, natural medicine. Mm -hmm. And I have funded her very generously. And uh, she's done very well. And she's come to the States a couple of times and had her at Hadassah and whatever. Mm -hmm. But you, that's not all you've been involved with. Tell us about some of your other projects. Well, no, that's it in Israel. Oh, in Israel, basically, yes. Except what I give to UGA. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm on the board, and then on the board of governors at the Weizmann Institute. And I used to go there every year for the meetings, but I haven't been the last two years, I think. It's a very hard trip. It is. But you've also been involved with projects right here at home. Right here, yes. So then I got involved with, um, well, my first significant one was the <coughs> produce the Charitable Produce Center. And how did I know about this? Why did I do this? I was at a Weizmann Institute. Uh, they had these uh, symposiums, uh, you know, in different places in the country and in Los Angeles. I went for this, and on Friday night, the, all the visitors were sent to someone's home for Shabbat dinner. And I went to Mickey Weiss's home, and. Uh, so I inquired, well, what does this gentleman do? And he had been in the produce <coughs> business for 30 years, had retired, and then started this charitable produce center where um, he started with the concept of with edible but not saleable. And in Los Angeles, every all the food that comes in there, comes through there, has to be, has to have a stamp of approval. They open up every crate, every, and if there's one berry in there that could be, you know, mildewed, or if there's, or if the life of the, uh, they need a two week life of the fruits, vegetables, whatever, for the uh, chain groceries to, there are different criterias. And he had the idea of why are they trashing all this when edible, but not, and that's what he started with. And when I heard what he did, I get I got so excited because believe this, after I left Page Boy probably a couple of years and I didn't I was at um, Tom Thumb and I saw the um, clerk there shuffling off some um, fruit into a cardboard box and I said, Well what are you gonna do with that? And he said, Well, I guess they're gonna trash it and I went to the manager and I said I wonder if something would look good could I pick it up and take it to you know someone and it you know the Navy mm -hmm. he said we'd love that but we would become liable if they became ill so when I met Mickey Wise I said Mickey what about liability he said they changed that law several years ago so that was my introduction and so he called the he said you need to be at um, 
a place where they're already distributing food. And so the North Texas Food Bank was the perfect one for this. And we made a couple calls from there and he talked to them. And when I came back home, I went up to see them several times. And, <coughs> well, they didn't know if they could handle it. It was perishable. They never handled perishable mm -hmm. food. And they just didn't know. And I, they said, well, I said, well, what, you know, and then I, I got down to the basic. We don't have any money. And it's a separate operation. So I originally funded it for six months to see if it would work. And the rest is history. To this day, we have distributed now over 37 million pounds of fresh produce to the needy. Mm -hmm. At no cost to them, we get it all donated and um, uh, you know, go through it at the um, at the food bank and distribute. And the um, part that is not, I mean, we have a certain limit. If they give us over, a, I don't know, it's ten percent or whatever, whatever it is, we don't take that kind of produce. Mm -hmm. So this has worked out, and there's a fabulous manager of the food bank. And so it's under their auspices, but it's financed differently, and it's a different operation. But when people come to pick, see, they thought, oh, they won't get as much as our canned and, and um, you know, box, uh, you know, the produce as uh, uh, their uh, box or canned, you know, their commodities and cut down. But it didn't. It increased because, and now they get the. Uh, the fresh, the produce with it. Mm -hmm. So it has worked out. I'm, I'm really proud of this. Yeah. And now, are you still involved with this project? Oh, yes, mm -hmm. I'm still involved. In fact, the head of the food bank, Jan Pruitt, is the one that recommended me for my last award. She recommended me to the nominating committee at the, uh, this, you know about my last I was that we yes yes a couple of and weeks we're going ago. to take a, and when we're finished with everything else we're going to take a stroll and take a look at and she's got some, some questions are you finished with what the so whole interview? the interview yeah oh you are well, yeah she's got a lot more to go oh okay oh, your jacket just oh my jacket oh I guess <laughs> uh, this was to and when I was honored um, by the um, Association of, of, of um, Fundraising Professionals. That was just recently, a couple yeah. of weeks ago. I wore this jacket to commemorate my first significant uh, philanthropy uh, adventure. And uh, they just loved this because it, it represented you know what you do what, yes. what I do with the acorn yes. buttons the uh, produce inscriptions and even the date and finding this is you know some people say it's a coincidence and I say no it's more powerful it was a God incidence that I found this hanging on a rack with other jackets at Neiman's when I was just not even looking not even shopping but seeing a, a sleeve hang out and it just it was me. yours. So I know, I mean, that's what I say. There are no coincidences. There are God incidences. Mm -hmm. Now, are you, avail uh, um, are you actively doing any other philanthropy issues that, right now? Oh, yes. Tell us about that. Common Sense. You don't know about my Common Sense program at the DISD, the Dallas Independent Schools? Oh, that has just blossomed like unbelievable. And I read about this in <laughs> Parade Magazine. It was a full page and then some with all these pennies piled up and with these kids in back of it. And this is money they had raised to give, you know, to charitable uh, organizations. And it fascinated me because I've always been one to save and whatever. 
And what I liked about the program was it puts the children in charge. They not only collect the money, but they decide where it goes. Mm -hmm. So I um, called the one that started this in New York. He wasn't very anxious about it. He was afraid we wouldn't handle it right. It would not bring credit to his name, and I assured him. But anyway, ended up going to New York and meeting him. And he happened to be Jewish, and that was a real good connection. Because I asked him, well, what do you do outside of this? And then he told me he was active in the synagogue. I said, oh. And so that was a, a tie that, and so we tied into this. Uh, but he told me, he was here just recently because he's so excited about what we're doing. And he said, when this article ran all over the country, he said he didn't know it was two or 3,000 letters of inquiring about it, and he had all these brochures to send out. He sent them out, he said, I didn't have one reply. He said, you're the only one. And I didn't reply, I called him. Mm -hmm. And so we're the only one, now he's trying to do this national, and he's more open, but there are a lot of criteria. But he wanted to see what we're doing because we have done so well. In seven years, these kids have collected and distributed $214,000 to nonprofits, and we encourage them to do it in their area, though if they, they choose, they can give it to the Red Cross, they can give it to Ken, whatever, but we do, um, and, you know, try to persuade them to, you know, just give them that, that hint. And what the school does, if they raise $1,000, they have their own uh, round table, we call it, with six or eight, and they are the ones that decide where the money goes. But it, it puts the kids in charge, and it has worked out so well, and they are so excited to help others. We have a motivation meeting before it all starts. We have a distribution at the end where the recipient comes and, you know, receives these uh, checks, and um, it's just an exciting, venture because if these kids are not rich, they're the poor kids. Mm -hmm. This is the DISD and they're excited, they're able to help others. But this is just unbelievable that they, and I handle no money. I have the Communities Foundation of Texas. I've engaged them to handle all the money. All the money is turned into them. Mm -hmm. The schools count their money and then they send it there and then the, all the requests they have to be 501c3 for the uh, community's foundation to handle it. And now I've established a scholarship fund and I get little perks around, you know, it's just uh, it really took I, oh, I'm, I'm constantly involved. So see, when I get involved, when I see something that I think will be a benefit to Dallas, I go for it mm -hmm. and I stay involved. And so that has just, I, I think is one is very significant because it teaches them at an early age you plant the seed as the preachers would say mm -hmm. and you know but then you see what you know you nurture it and how it grows can you tell us about your family today well you have to hear my <laughs> other one wait oh, but that's okay. not all okay oh, you think you're that's what I'm... <laughs> no and then I established the Alternative Medicine Research Foundation of Texas because I was interested <laughs> in research. You know that from my involvement with, with the Weizmann Institute. But this is something right here. Alternative medicine, and I'm interested in alternative medicine and without the um, horrendous side effects of you know, a lot of these medications. And in my search, and I had to, um, a foundation, I had a very prestigious board, and one of my board members said I should check out hyperbaric oxygen therapy because it had helped her mother and father. Her father was a federal judge, <coughs> and she was the 
my friend that was on my board was a lawyer husband. So, I mean, this guy is the man on the street that say hyperbaric oxygen is wonderful. And it said it had helped them, so I searched that out, went up to meet the grandfather, I guess, of hyperbaric in America. And, um, so I started that, and my, the center at Baylor is called Louise Gardner Center for Hyperbaric Medicine, and it's a healing tool for many conditions. In fact, there are 14 conditions, uh, conditions approved by Medicare and insurance, but the one that is used the most, where it's used the most, is for diabetic wounds uh, that don't heal, and this is on the foot specifically, and instead of amputating, you go in a hyperbaric oxygen, and it's a series of these treatments. It's, you don't go in one time and you're healed. It depends on your condition, how long you've had it, and what, but save many limbs with this and also other um, carbon, um, with carbon monoxide, I mean, you know, poisoning and whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a miracle. It's a healing tool for many conditions where the body has been deprived of oxygen because it oxygenates all the cells in your body. It's oxygen under pressure. And depending on your condition, what pressure it is, how long you stay in, how many times you go in, and also that's very, that's very involved. And that's in that, it's a healing tool, I call it, for many conditions. A lot of doctors haven't recognized it yet, but hopefully they will. They didn't have it in medical school. They what could, you know? But all the young doctors now they're the ones that are really more open. I don't know if you found that true or not, but I have. Mm -hmm. I'll turn so, to that some research foundation. The what? The foundation. The speakers. Oh, and yes, I had speakers come. Um, they were at, um, my first speaker that I had come was David Eisenberg, the head of the uh, research center at Harvard uh, in alternative medicine. Mm -hmm. And he created, I had at um, UT Southwest here and there, big auditorium there. Anyway, we had a thousand health professionals come for this. And then at night, had this at SMU, we had to do two theaters there, the Bob Hope and the other one that's right next to McFarland. Uh, no, no, no that one in McFarland. No. Uh, it was the, um, anyway, we had such a demand from the public. This is really news, alternative medicine. People had heard about it, but really, what is it? And it was unbelievable, the turnout for this. And because of the speaker, I mean, he was the head at Harvard, and he had done this research to show, to prove that there were more people going for alternative therapies than they were for their regular, you know, and they had to pay out of pocket now for these alternative therapies. They were more going for that than they were going to their regular doctor. Mm -hmm. And so it took the medical two years to recognize his research that he'd done, but after he did it then, you know, it sort of, you know, it was blown up and um, people heard about it and it was record breaking who came. Now, the next speaker I had next year um, was, um, Michael Lerner, and he was an expert in cancer. I felt, well, everybody either has cancer, they know someone, and we'll surely have a, as many as, you know, that we had before, but it went downhill from there because already two years later, um, it wasn't as newsy as this other alternative method. <coughs> and I mean, we had, and I had that at McFarland, I mean, I thought, ooh, we got to have a bigger place. And then I had another speaker, James Garden, who, mind body, um, has a, um, a center in Washington. Uh, it's a mind body connection. And that was a, really a little far advanced for the medical. And mm -hmm. 
heaven. And so, I mean, the response to come was not as great as on my first one. And then I did a, um, at the medical school, I instigated that program for the med students and alternative medicine, I had speakers come, and I, I even served box lunches. I thought, well, if they didn't come to learn, they'd come to eat. <laughs> Well, they have such a busy schedule, and it just, that was not what I'd say one of my real successes. <coughs> and then, oh, I don't know, I funded something else for macular degeneration there. And um, so, I mean, I've been active. I've, you know, mm -hmm. stayed active. And um, so that was um, um, my, with hyperbaric oxygen, but I feel, and I really want more research done. That was the whole idea of this center to validate some of the other conditions that should be validated. Um, and um, eventually it will get this done, but you've got to have a lot of research done to validate this for your medical profession and for the insurance companies to pay for it. So that was, uh, that's been a really big one. And um, then just so we don't neglect anything. Okay. That's for the, the body. The, uh, I saw this uh, exercise equipment that is so fabulous for those that can't move their limbs. And uh, it's called a quadricizer. And I saw this on one of my adventures to uh, go to a symposium and had this, uh, he had this uh, exhibit outside the lecture hall. And for someone who can't move there, I mean, it moves all four of your limbs. And it's like walking motion. I mean, the way it's, it's set up, it's really, fabulous. so I've given a unit to uh, Scottish Rite Children's, uh, you know, and to UT Southwestern <coughs> Rehab, and to the the Children's House at Baylor. So we have those three going. That's my latest for that, you know, exercise. Right. So you see, I'm, I've covered a lot you of areas. Certainly area. have. And then the last thing I'm as interested in, and still am, of course, is. Um, the, it's a new center for uh, age-related vision loss, and that's at the uh, uh, Foundation for the Blind, but it's another arm of that. Mm -hmm. We have all the latest equipment, all the latest, you know, um, information on macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. It's like an epidemic now. There are so many that have. So anyway, I'm still out there looking what will be next. That's terrific. If I find a good project, I'll certainly give yeah. you a call. Um, but tell us about your family. Oh, well, this is one of my offsprings that I'm so <laughs> proud of, and she is so precious. I just can't begin to tell you. And I've got a married daughter who has uh, three sons, my French, and they are married, and. I have now two great-grandchildren and two more on the way. Oh, my. But this one and my son, have not, they're not married. They haven't produced. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it, <coughs> I do have the three. Mm -hmm. And that is my, my family, because I have a very small um, family history, you know, going back. Okay, well, let's take a little time now and take a, a little walk. We're going to stop okay. the tape so you can show us some of the awards that you, we've seen. And okay, so you see it's very difficult to get this down to... Yeah, it is, but we're going to try. So okay. we're going to... Leslie's going to turn the camera on to the battery so we can walk in and you can okay. show us. This is tape two of an interview with... Louise Gardner, and uh, we're going to take a look at a number of the awards that she's won uh, throughout the years, and she's going to tell us a little bit about some of them. Okay. 
Well, this is my very latest, and uh, this is uh, by the um, Association of, Fun of Fundraising Professionals. And this was a really, ex I, I was the outstanding philanthropist of 2005, and where I really excelled was my innovative approach to philanthropy. And the one that recommended me was the head who recommended me to the uh, nominating committee. I don't know how many names were submitted, but she nominated me and I was chosen. And they made me feel like queen for a day. Mm -hmm. And after the event, I called Jan Pruitt, said this is something they had given me before, uh, saying how many pounds had been. And uh, I called her and I said, Jan, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be queen for a day. And two days later, I received this crown. I've got to show you the presentation of how it came. And she said, you're our queen every day. But wait, let me just show you. I had to mention it. That's where I edit. OK. Can you stop for a minute? Well, if I find the button in the dark. Two days later, special delivery. I get this. And here it is, like this. <laughs> And this is tied here. And I open it up. And here it is. <laughs> You're our queen every day. Oh, how lovely. So I put it up here now. Oh, it goes this way. <laughs> it's Gigi, I'll take this back. Okay, and here, this is from the Weizmann Institute of Science, Louise and Charles Gartner Professional Chair of Biochemistry. And this is from the Dallas Home for the Jewish Aged. This is for my many years I served on the board. And this is the Murray Wreath Award, which is the highest honor that Hadassah can give. And when they honored me at this fabulous dinner, this was one of the things they gave. Oh, and this is from the that new center of the age-related vision loss that I'm uh, on the cabinet of that. And oh no, this is the food bank. I'm sorry. Food Bank gave me that, and this is the one for the vision loss. And these are two from uh, being Lynn's Award nominees, mm -hmm. one of the nominees. <coughs> and this is when I was honored at Akiba Academy. This was my first big dinner celebration where they honored me, and that was from Akiba. And over here, oh, and this, oh, I think this is from the Independent School District for going the extra mile. And that down there is from, um, uh, that's from, uh, let's see, who is that from? That's right. Oh, that's Scottish Rock, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh! This is another little ditty from Kiba, and I've got another something from Kiba. And this I love. This is uh, from the uh, Common Sense Program, and can you read the inscription? In this little small. Let's see. Change. Changing the world for the better, one penny at a time, through Common Sense Dallas. Presented to Miss Louise Gardner, April 15, 2004. Lovely. Isn't that lovely? So I love that. 
And this is something from uh, Philanthropy Magazine. And what are these? Oh, that's the Lindsay Award. And these are my children. That's uh, <coughs> a little passe. <laughs> but uh, that's my daughter, her husband, her three sons. They're married. And uh, this was, I think, on my 80th. Oh, I forget which birthday that was. <laughs> so these are all Keep little going. momentums. Keep going. Oh, oh, this I'm so proud of. Right? right? There. This is the Charitable Produce Center of Dallas, and they awarded me this. This was right in the beginning, and um, they had a contest at some of the schools, and I said, this is my Monet here. It says, thanks for helping feed hungry families. And this is from an elementary school in uh, wherever it is, uh, anyway. But I, they framed it for me and gave it to me. And this is the certificate of appreciation from the United States Department of Agriculture. And I've got others that I can't hang. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, and up there. Oh, that's from the Library of Congress. That's when we had, it's all documented in here. That's um, the treasures uh, from the Judaica. Judaic uh, treasures from the ends of the earth. And this was an exhibit at the Meadows mm. Museum, uh, Meadows uh, School of the Arts. And it was there for about six weeks, and they had more visitors to come see that than you any exhibit they had ever had up to that time. I was there. I was there. Did you remember it? I did. Okay, it and that's something that yeah. you sent it Very to me. Good. pregnant and that was in um, it was several pages three or four pages in good housekeeping when the designer has a baby and this was documenting my my scientists at the um, Weizmann Institute and this is when we distributed our first million pounds of produce we were so excited and who would believe that 11 years later, it's over 37 million pounds now. That's me, right there. And that's my sister. She was into yoga something. This sister was never really into yoga. That's the best she could do. <laughs> okay. Oh, and you know, like this. This is when I was honored by Hadassah. And look who our guest speaker was. The Fonz. Henry Winkler. You remember him? <laughs> he was fabulous. And a friend of mine put all this together. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And this is my center at um, Baylor, and that was our open house. There's the unit here, that's the multi-chamber, then we also <coughs> have a mono-chamber now. And that's the entrance right there. And they gave me that hat when they were under construction. Pink. Pink, uh-huh. <laughs> And this is from uh, when we were celebrating um, the beginning of the, when I had uh, given the grant to Baylor for the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We, they gave a dinner honoring me. And uh, that was, uh, what was her name? They came here to, uh, to present it to me. Harriet Earhart? Earhart, yes. Uh -huh. She flew in from Austin to do this. She flew out right after this deal. Mm -hmm. 
And these are just more documentations of the uh, my ward at Hadassah. Mm -hmm. I've got all kinds of, because I've given to Hadassah in so many different areas. So that's it. And I've got other stuff that I, don't, I couldn't think anymore. And this is just <laughs> another that I got from, uh, I don't know, which I loved. And I love the frame. And one final question. Yes. How did you get the name Tootsie? Well, I understand my sister gave it to me when I was a baby, and it, it, I think it came from the funny papers. That's a long time ago. 85 now. I'll be 86 soon. So I've got quite a... A wonderful history. Well, I'm very grateful. And we thank you very I'm much. Very, I'm very grateful, and I appreciate all these. And I've, uh, I've done everything a little bit differently, even by having a very rare cancer, which I'm recovered from. And um, that was a little over a year ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, my daughter said, Mom, you don't have to do everything so different. <laughs> and in fact, many, many doctors haven't even heard of this type of cancer. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I'm gr very grateful that I'm still able to go and do and help. And we thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And society. thanks for your perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that is. Well, your life story was really fascinating, and you've thank done, you. given so much back to the community. Well, I've tried. As they say, she tried. Like Amelia Earhart, I'll remember that on her tombstone if she had one. And she yeah. wanted it, but she tried. And I've got all those scrapbooks to document.